Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Here's co-host Bob Bennis. Broadcasting from the studios in the Cousins Center, the hub of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, overlooking beautiful Lake Michigan, good morning and welcome. Normally we say hello to His Excellency Archbishop Jerome Mastecki. The Archbishop is away. He's not with us today. But in his place, we have the very formidable Father Paul Hartman. Father, good morning. Good morning. I don't know what formidable might mean, but uh, I appreciate the introduction. <laughs> Nothing but a compliment. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we're happy to have our guest today. We're going to be talking about the 15th anniversary of Catholic Community Foundation. And with us today is John Herbers. John, good morning and welcome. Good morning. John, in reading your bio, I see you professionally, you are an attorney. And one of the things that caught my eye, because we had Father Jacob Strand on with us a few weeks ago, is you are one of those infamous members of the Catholic Man Cave up at St. Monica's Parish. Yes, it's a great men's group. We're very fortunate that Father Jacob uh, was able to help us form it. Mm Mm-hmm. We're regretful that he has to leave to go to Rome, right. but uh, Father Andrew Lynn, newly ordained, is going to take Father Jacob's place and keep the men's group going strong. We uh, we like to start the show off by enlightening our audience as to who you are and a little bit about you, your family life, your, your Catholic background. If you would tell the audience, tell us, tell the audience, please. Sure. Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, cradle Catholic, mom and dad, strong faith life. I went to St. Gabriel grade school. From there, I went to one of the two Jesuit high schools in St. Louis, St. Louis University High School. From there, Georgetown uh, University for an undergraduate degree, and then Boston College Law School. So the Jesuits like to say they got me, and they never quite let me go. <laughs> and we, we can, there are so much we can talk about on that point, but we, we won't today. We won't. So I moved to Milwaukee in 1982. Uh, we initially moved into Holy Family Parish. Then uh, our family grew, and we needed a bigger house, but we stayed in Whitefish Bay, so then we changed parishes to St. Monica, where we've been for 25 years. My wife, Norma, and I are very, very engaged in the parish life and Mm -hmm. the school life and uh, lots of different activities around the community. Tell us how, how you started getting involved and got connected with the Catholic Community Foundation. Well, I've always been interested in doing things that serve the, the mission of the church and serve the church itself. So about 10 years ago or so, I was invited to an annual reception that the foundation had for advisors. I went to learn about what the foundation was doing. I liked what I saw. Pat Mahegan, who was also a uh, St. Monica parishioner, uh, he's uh, an accountant with uh, Deloitte & Touche, invited me to think about joining the board. I joined the board, and now six years later, I'm still on the board. This year, I'm the chair of the board of uh, the Catholic Community Foundation. Well, and you'll never get off. I mean, that's the way (laughs) Catholic institutions work, or something else will take its place very quickly. The Catholic Community Community Foundation is a wonderful vehicle uh, that in Mm -hmm. in the places where I've served, presently Catholic Memorial High School, we do benefit from uh, some grants and some uh, designated funds within it. I think it's a profound opportunity for individuals within the community to participate in the greater the works of the church. And, and maybe you want to offer some reflection on that, some of the a wonderful annual report. You know, what are some of the, the, the wonderful, the elevator speech about the benefits of the Catholic Community Foundation? The Catholic Community Foundation allows individuals and families to perpetuate the work that they want to see done in our corner of the world, our archdiocese. From the beginning, our foundation's footprint was the same as the archdiocese. We don't uh, keep all the money here in the archdiocese, but we hope that most of the work can be funded here in the archdiocese. It allows not just individuals and families to support the work of the church, but we also have a second mission, which is to help Catholic organizations, often schools and parishes, handle their investment management. So we actually are the investment agent for 59 agencies, 92 different funds, wow. where the parishes, for example, uh, give us some or all of their endowment fund We have an excellent team of investment advisors. Everything is socially screened through the USCCB, the Catholic bishops screen, uh, and the the parishes have an easy, simple, very productive way to invest their money. You operate under the 10 counties that make up the archdiocese, but you are separate from the archdiocese. Absolutely. Fifteen years ago, we were separately incorporated. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have... uh, the, the only connection to the archdiocese is we're here, and we're doing much of the same work as the archdiocese itself does, but we are absolutely separate and distinct. 
the notion of a community foundation is is fairly common, though it's it's not it's a secular legal reality. Yes, in the greater Milwaukee area, we have many community foundations. The Greater Milwaukee Foundation is a perfect example. Uh, so this is not unique. There are other Catholic community foundations across the country, often diocesan based, uh, and so ours is is unique in the sense that it's here, but it's not unique that it's the only one across the country. And when you talk about the works that you have done, in particular in the time that you have been part of the board, what are some of the, give us some of the highlights of what stand out to you uh, that you are most proud of, if you would please. Sure. Well, when our foundation was formed, uh, a sizable portion of the funds were dedicated to serving health care needs in the greater Milwaukee area. So half of our grants are given just for health care. Now, we define that fairly broadly Mm -hmm. because it's not just hospitals and clinics, but it's wellness. We're seeing more and more wellness programs, which is an important aspect of healthcare. But beyond that, it's uh, educational, it's faith formation, it's leadership formation, it's serving those agencies, mostly Catholic, but not exclusively, those agencies who are uh, carrying out the work that the church is trying to accomplish. The work then, healthcare, you know, what what are some of the names that some of the listeners might recognize some of the programs or opportunities? We have so many programs. Just this past year, we granted over 109 grants. To be honest with you, I can't remember them all. Uh, most of the grants are in the range of ten to $15,000 per year. We try to keep annual grants under $20,000 because we do not want to become the sole source of funding for the, these agencies, but we do want to help them become transformative in their missions. So it's from the healthcare systems themselves to the individual clinics, to the wellness programs, to the educational institutions, all sorts of startup agencies that are looking for some seed money capital. That's where we like to, to put our, our money to start to make a change in our in our neighborhood. And when I was researching for the show, to put this in perspective for the audience, the, the Catholic Community Foundation has allocated, since its beginning in 2001, and, and we're celebrating the 15th anniversary, there have been over 1,063 grants, which have totaled over $7 million. That's a lot of money doing a lot of good things. So congratulations on that. It's an awful lot of money, and we're very, very proud of that. Uh, my own personal goal when I took the, the chairmanship was to get our grants to over a $1 million per year. We're not going to quite get there, but uh, with a little bit of help from the listeners who might want to think about endowing a fund at the uh, at the foundation, we'll have more dollars that we can use then to leverage and to make more grants. But we're very proud of the work that we do. There, there are different categories. You, you talked about you advise uh, parishes or institutions. You have named funds within within the overall community foundation, and then there's unrestricted or or not so narrowly defined. Do, can people just offer donations directly to the Catholic Community Foundation? Yes, they can. We have a general uh, unrestricted fund where the board then will will dedicate the funds. Uh, the grant funds in uh, in all the different categories that we support. But a donor can say, I would like my my investments to go for a particular agency, a particular school. Case in point, several years ago, uh, a donor wanted to support high school scholarships at the Catholic schools in our archdiocese. So their donor fund supports uh, scholarships to the Catholic high schools. We have other what we call field of interest gifts. So people who want to support health care, for example, or people who want to support faith formation can dedicate the fund to support grants in that area without without specifying a particular agency. Or then we have the general unrestricted funds that does what the what the uh, foundation wants to do. The, the, the work then with a family coming to you, I mean, how would someone start this process mm-hmm. of saying, you know, whether it's estate planning, whether whether they won the lottery and, and have an opportunity now to start setting things up. You know, what are, what are some of the first questions they need to ask themselves, and then what are some of the first steps to be taken? Well, I've been very fortunate professionally as an attorney and as an estate planning attorney. I help guide clients through the thought process of their estate planning and whether philanthropy is part of it or ought to be part of it. I don't choose for clients whether philanthropy ought to be, but if it is, then I help them think about what they're trying to accomplish. So part of the thought process is, do I have enough capital to support causes, not just children and grandchildren? And if I do, then what sorts of causes? And what vehicle is the best uh, to use to support my, my mission? 
the the work of of the Catholic Community Foundation has has grown both of by the incorporation of more advised funds, the incorporation of more endowed funds or named funds, uh, but also by the the rebound in the economy. Um, you know how how you know how do you read the signs and how do you make your pitch for you know bringing people in in comparison to the the other structures and available structures out there. Well, I think that the uh, mission of our foundation being consistent with that of the Catholic Church is very important to many of our donors. I have clients of every faith or of no faith, and the Catholic Community Foundation would not be appropriate for all of my clients. But for those of my clients who are faithful Catholic uh, donors, then this is a very useful um, vehicle to use it for. It's also very flexible because the donors can designate year to year which particular grants they wish to make. Hmm. Uh, and if they like this organization this year, they don't have to feel like they are always committed to that organization for all time. When you talk about how most people are coming to the Catholic Community Foundation, is it because of referrals from other people who have uh, contributed, or is it because of, of the work that you, all of you on the board and other people are doing on the inside? What, where, where do most people find out about this and, and, and learn about this to, and participate? Most people will find out about it by word of mouth, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps by their advisor. For example, I met with clients a year ago who were setting up charitable gifts under their estate plan, almost all of which were Catholic. And I asked them, are you aware of the Catholic Community Foundation? Because this might be a vehicle to use to accomplish your wishes. They'd never heard of the foundation before. So I was able to educate them through that process. But it's mostly word of mouth. And that's where our new contest through the parishes is designed to help us get that word of mouth out. And we're going to talk about that contest in just a, in just a moment on the other side of the break. Our guest today is John Herbers. John is a, an attorney. He is also the chair of the Catholic Community Foundation. And as part of what we're talking about is their 15th anniversary celebration. We're going to take a break for a few messages and then the news from our friends over the Catholic Herald. You're listening to Living Our Faith right here on Relevant Radio for Southeast Wisconsin. Put more heart in your hands. These are words St. Camillus used to encourage his followers when caring for the sick. And today these words are at the essence of care provided by employees at St. Camillus campus in Wauwatosa. St. Camillus nursing administrator Sandra Dugan shares a recent more heart in your hands moment. An 84-year-old resident who came to us after a massive stroke that left her left side completely paralyzed. Now, five months post-stroke care with our excellent rehab department, she is able to use a walker. She does all of her own activities of daily living with minimal assist, and her memory is great. She's now going to spend her winter in Florida with her niece. The best part is to work with someone at their time of health crisis and then see them return to living a life to their fullest again. For more information regarding St. Camilla's rehabilitation, go to relevantradio.com keyword rehab. Good morning. I'm Grace David for the Catholic Herald and catholicherald.org. As with the rest of our country, Catholics' attention has been focused on the assassination of five Dallas law enforcement officers and the aftermath of those killings. Dallas Bishop Kevin J. Farrell, who has blogged in the past several months about the escalating gun violence across the country and world, reiterated his call for prayer and peace after the Dallas attack. Our first concern is for the families who have lost loved ones in this tragic attack, he said. We pray for consolation and healing for both the families and those killed and wounded. We are reminded of the ever-present danger to those who are dedicated to protecting us. We have been swept up in the escalating cycle of violence that has now touched us intimately as it has others throughout our country and the world, Bishop Farrell continued. All lives matter, black, white, Muslim, Christian, Hindu. We are all children of God, and all human life is precious. We cannot lose respect for each other, and we call upon all of our civic leaders to speak to one another and work together to come to a sensible resolution to this escalating violence, he said. Let us implore God, our Heavenly Father, to touch the minds and hearts of all people to work together for peace and understanding. As we noted last week, young adults in southeastern Wisconsin will undertake a 50-mile pilgrimage of mercy beginning Thursday, July 28th. The trek from St. Francis de Sales Seminary to Holy Hill 
coincides with World Youth Day. If you are a young adult who would like to participate in the pilgrimage, call 414-747-6437. That's 414-747-6437. Speaking of World Youth Day, Archbishop Lestecki and pilgrims from the Archdiocese of Milwaukee will be among the anticipated 2 million participants who will join Pope Francis for the biennial event in Krakow, Poland. If you have not had the opportunity to visit CatholicHerald.org, this is a good time to do so. In addition to daily Catholic news from Washington and the Vatican, CatholicHerald.org is a great archive for local Catholic stories. In addition, you'll also find reviews of books that might not be reviewed elsewhere, and you'll read movie reviews that note the moral suitability of films for viewers. It's all at CatholicHerald.org. Inviting you to read the Catholic Herald, to believe what you read, and to act upon it, this is Grace David. Thank you for listening. We now return you to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Lestecki. Welcome back to Living Our Faith. Our guest today is John Herbers. John is a parishioner along with his family up at uh, St. Monica's in Whitefish Bay. He is also the chair of the Catholic Community Foundation, and they are celebrating their 15th anniversary, and we're going to talk about that now. Um, we're also joined in the studio here by Father Paul Hartman. Father Paul is sitting in for the Archbishop today, who is away. And it's a pleasure to be here, Bob. Uh, wonderful, wonderful show. Middle of summer here, a lot mm-hmm. of great things happening. Uh, today, the Feast of St. Bonaventure, and so many things, uh, graces and blessings. You know, John, I, I want to jump back a little bit, something we just touched on so briefly, and, and they're a wonderful work of the, the foundation, but your own lived faith mm-hmm. is what makes any of these things valuable and worthwhile. And so tell me, you know, and you mentioned Father Jacob Strand's work to to start the Catholic Man Cave. Yes, that's the name that we gave ourselves because we meet in the church basement in the mornings at 6 a.m. And it feels like a cave, especially nine months out of the year. But we're very fortunate. We have about 60 or 70 men uh, from both St. Monica and St. Eugene's because we're uh, 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 two parishes sharing uh, two sets of priests. Um, and we meet weekly, Thursday mornings at 6 a.m. We start with breakfast. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have small groups, and the groups rotate through who's going to serve breakfast. Uh, Then we have a video of some sort, usually 25 minutes, half hour of a video. Quite often it's a series done by Father, now Bishop Robert Barron. Mm -hmm. And then we have small group discussion for about another hour. And we've been going strong for three years. We can always use more men. Uh, You don't have to be from our parishes to join us. We will take all comers. You just have to be awake. At 7 a.m. Uh, at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Yeah. 6 a.m. Yeah. Right. Although now, that, the coffee's strong, so you'll wake up by 7. Did that Did that start with the uh, That Man Is You yes. program? We, we, no, we started with Father Barron's Christianity. Okay. Right. I, I'm sorry, his, his his Catholicism series. But yep. we, we tried That Man Is You, and to be perfectly honest, it didn't work for our group. Okay. I know lots of parishes who use mm-hmm. it quite successfully. Our mm-hmm. group just didn't like it as much. What was the appeal to you? Mm-hmm. What drew you into that Getting up that early. <laughs> well, this is actually the second men's group I'm, in, I'm involved with. Um, I was one of the initial members of a group that we call the Bible Boys. We've been working together for about 25 years now. We meet evenings. Um, and so the man cave is, a, is Thursday morning coffee and donuts. The Bible Boys is a Wednesday evening beer and pretzel uh, Bible study wow. group. So it's a smaller group. There's only eight of us. Uh, and over the years, guys have moved out of town. Guys have dropped out, whatever. But we have a strong group. Um, and I was, as I was telling Father Paul, um, we're working right now on the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And it's a very easy, readable book that gives us plenty to talk about. A lot to talk about in that. You have such a, a classically Catholic cultural upbringing, all the Jesuit schools you went through, the, the Catholic grade school and then Jesuit high school, college, law school. You're a lawyer, um, you know, kind of that way that the Catholics moved into the fore. We've been talking at other times on programs like this about the Catholics' role in society. I mean, yours is yours is a success story of Catholic education, Catholic formation, and Catholics trying to change the community. Uh, you know, do you feel a responsibility because of that? I absolutely do. And the more I learn about my faith, the more I realize that I wasn't put here for me. I was put here for everyone else. And so everything I do, I view through the prism of what is the ministry that God has given me. It's not an ordained ministry, and it's more than just uh, the married life uh, vocation. It is to to be God's hands and, and feet and eyes and ears here on our earth. So tell me how then the Catholic Community Foundation, is is that a ministry? It absolutely is. 
Um, it was a leading question. I yes. was leading the witness. <laughs> well done. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Counselor. Well, as with everything uh, in a professional's life, there's so many hours in a day, and we have to find ways to not just serve our clients, but also serve our community. And the Catholic Community Foundation is one of the many activities that I've chosen to get involved in, with that serve the community as well as um, my family and my parish and everyone. Uh, you mentioned earlier, and I think it's one of the it's it's certainly one of the differentiating factors for a Catholic foundation like this, like the Catholic Community Foundation, and that's the social screening. The, the Bishops Conference has a set of parameters, recommendations for social socially responsible investing, social screening. Um, tell our listeners a little bit about that as a mechanism, as a process, as a, something that makes a difference. It's a very important difference, and this is especially important for the agencies where we are the investment managers, the parishes, the schools, for example, who need to invest well, but also need to invest according to the uh, Catholic bishops' guidelines. And it's not that easy for an individual investment manager to screen those things as well as our consultants allow us to. So quite honestly, we hired a consultant uh, out of New York City, and they perform the screening for us. And it's not just for us. This consulting firm actually works for many Catholic agencies across the country. So they've got the systems in place. And when it's time to look at an investment or an investment advisor, we simply ask the consultant, does it pass or not? If we get the green light, we can consider it. If we don't, then we move on to something else. Give a little bit of, of texture to what is screened out. Uh, some of the big ones would be uh, weapons, uh, uh, health care, things in the uh, um, contraception or the abortion world, um, some alcohol, some some medications. Uh, there's some all there's lots of different screens. Quite honestly, I'm the attorney. I'm not the, the investment advisor, so I mm -hmm. don't know all of the details. But those are the sorts of, of uh, activities that we as a church do not want to be supporting, even as passive investors. Right. Yeah. Trying to make sure that there's not a positive cooperation. In, in the morally questionable activities. So when you look at the four priorities uh, uh, of the foundation, and, and those are education, leadership development, health care for the underserved here in Milwaukee, and community building to strengthen the families and the parishes, as you mentioned before, over the course of your time on the board, John, how have the needs changed? How have you seen the, the evolution or the development? How, how do you answer that? We're seeing more and more what I'll call startup operations. Okay. A, social agencies that are trying to uh, attack a specific issue mm -hmm. that need money to get up and running. They need uh, an office to work out of. They need a salary for uh, an administrative assistant. Uh, and what we're finding is that uh, there's not one solution to all problems, that there's many solutions to many problems. And so by, by letting the free market of philanthropy, so to speak, work its magic, we're able to support uh, the good works of lots of different causes. We spoke in the first segment of, of, the, of the program how people can bring to bear their own uh, stewardship, their own ability to invest or start up funds. Now, you, you draw just, from, you know, just grant requests from parishes, or is it a wider group? Well, for this particular contest, it's just from parishes. But in general... Well, I think you have to tell everybody about the contest. We, let's, let's restate the contest. Okay. <laughs> so in honor of our 15th anniversary, we're having a contest that's open to all parishes in the archdiocese, all 200 parishes. We're going to give away uh, gifts of $15,000 each, a total of five of those gifts, so $75,000 out of our budget uh, for grants. We'll be giving to five different parishes to do something that's unique that is not a budgeted expense, that is on their wish list, uh, an activity and a, a new program, something that will help them jumpstart something that they're trying to accomplish in their corner of the archdiocese. So, so if, a, if a parish had a wish that could be fulfilled with those $15,000, the question to them is, what would it be? And, and then there's a submission process. Exactly right. What we're hoping is that the entire parish community uh, gets involved in this process mm -hmm. and gets ideas that percolate up through the pastoral council, through the finance council, through the school committee, but that the pastor is able to draw on the, the strength and mostly the creativity of the entire parish community to come up with an idea to satisfy a wish that the parish can't otherwise fulfill. 
and who's going to be told about this? The pastors are have already received something or will receive something or it, they have to come straight to the foundation? No, the pastors have received all of this information. We've publicized it in the Catholic Herald. Uh, we are asking that each parish uh, publish uh, an ad that we created and forwarded to them in their bulletin and that the uh, the pastors speak from the pulpit sometime during the month of May or June uh, to to advertise this to the community. Our, our um, application deadline is August 1st. Then the, during the month of August, our board will look at all of the uh, submissions. We hope we have 200 to choose from, and we will pick the top five best ideas in the archdiocese, and we'll be happy to announce the, the winners and the grant recipients at our reception in December. Now, the contest is designed for the parishes, but the grant requests that the Community Foundation, the Catholic Community Foundation entertains are not just from parishes. You've talked about the different organizations. Correct. This contest is unique in that it is only for the parishes, but our general grants typically are not for parishes. We, most of our grants are for social agencies as opposed to parishes themselves. We are uh, about to go into our last break, reminding the audience that everything you need to know about this show is at archmill.org, and you can also check us out on Facebook. A link to the Catholic uh, Community Foundation is available at archmill.org, or if you want to learn more right now, you can go to legaciesoffaith.org. Org. Our guest is John Herbers. You're listening to Living Our Faith here on Relevant Radio for Southeast Wisconsin. Many of us at some point in our lives must face a decision regarding how we can best be cared for when rehabilitation is necessary following surgery or a medical crisis. Hear from St. Camilla's Nursing Administrator, Sandra Dugan, regarding the exceptional rehabilitation program at St. Camilla's. What makes St. Camilla's Rehab unique and special as it compares to our competitors is that we are the only continuum of care campus in the area that offers skilled nursing, home health, and outpatient services. You will get consistent staff throughout your rehab journey, and there's excellent communication throughout the continuum in order to promote maximum outcomes. They also can continue with the home care therapists that they have already come to know and trust in their own home when they're discharged from our facility. For more information regarding St. Camilla's Rehabilitation, go to relevantradio.com keyword rehab. That's keyword rehab. Welcome back. We have to close, but we want to wish all the best to John Herbers and the Catholic Community Foundation, especially now in their 15th anniversary year. Thank you for all the great work we do. You do. Um, we close in prayer each week on this show. Father Paul, if you would. I think we'll use the prayer for the mission of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. If we can all join together, sure. let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we, we praise, praise you, you and we bless you. Bless you. For you are great indeed. Grant, we pray, as on that first Pentecost, that tongues of fire may descend upon us, and that the driving wind of your Holy Spirit may blow boldly into our hearts. Loving God, we ask you, make us effective and holy witnesses of the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Increase our faith through the sacramental life of the Church, Grant us courage to follow you as faithful disciples. Embolden us, O God, so that we may go forth to proclaim your gospel and renew the face of the earth. In this Archdiocese of Milwaukee, we humbly pray for strength and fortitude to follow your great commission to go and make disciples of all people, living our faith through word and deed, through the intercession of St. John the Evangelist, patron of the Archdiocese, and Mary, Mother of the Church, we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. God's blessings upon all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful weekend, and let's all be transformed by the Spirit. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki and co-host Bob Bennis. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.